Hello, I would like to talk about today's error we make in Bayesian phylogenetics. My name is Richard Bilderbeek. I'm a PhD in the group of Rampal H.N. Uh, theoretical and Evolutionary Community Ecology, which is part of GLIS, which is part of the University of Groningen. This presentation can be found on my GitHub, um, so you can always um, redo it, watch it. So I want to start with a theoretician's dream. So this picture shows you a very realistic simulation. Just look how realistic the water here is falling down and following the stream. The plants look very realistic. There's some fog effects here. And th th this is a great simulation. So the animals also very realistic. They are hidden. So but we would what this would give us a lot of insight if we would have this simulation at the subatomic level, then we can simply follow what everything's going on in nature and doing experiments on that. And then we can go forward or backwards in time, especially forward in time, and then we can see how species, for example, speciate. And we know it takes a long time, so would we have this super realistic computer simulation? We can just watch what happens. Sadly we don't, there's not uh, the computer power to do so, so we need to cut corners, so we need to simplify things. And that brings me to the goal of my talk. The goal of my talk will be to explain uh, a bit about how Bayesian phylogenetics works. I will show you a Bayesian uh, analysis uh, about speciation and I will answer the core of a research question which is, um, so I'm doing a couple of projects I will show you the answering the core research question of two of them. So to start with Bayesian phylogenetics we start from this research question and here at the left we see a phylogeny and that's already one simplification. So a phylogeny assumes that if, two, if there's a speciation event, that there's no secondary gene flow anymore. So there's evidence that we should use phylogenetic networks, but let's say we stick to the simplification uh, that when a speciation has speciated, there's no secondary gene flow anymore. But that's definitely already open to, uh, to discussion. But assuming this phylogeny is a correct representation, or, or um, you can do that, that we agree on that, then we can answer ourselves the question like, alright, so we have five primate species here, including uh, our favorite species, and we can, answer the, we can look for the question like, who lived when? And additionally, the follow-up question will be, how complex should that calculation be? You'll see there will be some simplifications along the way. So how does that look like? How will we answer the question who lived when? Well, it will look like this. Oh, yeah, we start from here. We start from uh, an alignment. So from our species in the present, we don't, we, we don't know the phylogeny. We can never get a phylogeny from nature. What we can get is get a DNA alignment. And the DNA alignment, those are the nucleotides in the DNA, all species have that. And we need to align them, because DNA sequences can have different lengths, and they have, can have deletions or in, uh, insertions. So there's already, already another simplification that we need to align the DNA in a nice way. But assuming that this works, then we have our DNA alignment, so these are more than 700 base pairs. I took them from uh, a website from Beast2. I'll talk about Beast2 in a minute. And th these contains the five uh, primates, and this is how it looks like. So you see that this is some code. This is actually R code. So R is a programming language. It's a free and open source programming language. And this presentation is run by R Studio. Uh, you can actually see, for example, the progress bar here at the bottom. Um, and what it does, it shows the result of the computation. So th my presentation, it's not that I pasted this picture, no, it has just r done this and shown that. So I can't cheat, so if you see any picture, uh, you, can, you can verify that yes, this is calculated by the presentation. So I of course there's, I could cheat, but you can verify on the GitHub that I didn't. Alright, so this is the alignment we start with. And then it's already easy to measure who's, 
which two species are closest related because the closest related species have the most uh, most amount of similar nucleotides assuming some things but in general this is the case but the question is who lived when and this is how it will look like so if you do a Bayesian phylogenetic analysis you will get a posterior which contains phylogenies and parameter estimates so you see phylogenies you see parameter estimates these two are um, are concluded or inferred at the same time so um, every posterior state it estimates a phylogeny and a parameter estimate or parameters estimate at at, at the same time so it, it's, it's done jointly and what it will do is that that the posterior that the posterior, the, I will focus only on the trees, it will show that the trees that are more likely will be present more often and that also uh, allows you to see the uncertainty in our estimates. So this is how it will look like, you see there's a scale at the bottom as well and these are the five species. So this is where, where, where we go. And for that we could use a tool called BEAST2. So BEAST2 it's, um, it's called Bayesian Evolutionary Analysis by Sampling Trees. It's a widely used phylogenetic tool and it's beginner friendly. It's easy to get started. It's by Baukart et al. 2014. This is the BEAST book that came out this year or last year. So we could use that tool. This will work uh, just as great. But we do use uh, Babette. So Babette it's a, I, I'm part of the, uh, yeah, I wrote an article about that. It's an R package to call Bees2 from R. And this allows you to completely automate your pipeline. And for example, it also allows me to show you an analysis from an R presentation. And so else I needed to copy paste stuff, make screenshots, and now I can just do my analysis from this R Studio presentation. Also, Babette uh, yeah, has a nice interface, and you can use uh, like iterate over many alignments, for example. So it's very useful. It's, so if you're beyond this, uh, getting your feet wet with BS2, like the step to Babette should be small, and it will definitely pay off for more complex things. So to answer the question, who lived when, we need to set up our Bayesian inference. And to do that, we need to create a Markov chain Monte Carlo object. So a Bayesian, a Bayesian analysis it uses an MCMC. And an MCMC, it is, uh, so there's stochasticity in it because it's a Monte Carlo thing. It starts at a state and it checks how likely that state is. And then it follows an algorithm to go to a next state or stay in the same state. And with this algorithm, there is stochasticity in it, it will converge to uh, a representative state space and then it will do a correct sampling in which the likelier states are sampled just as much often so that we can uh, see how uh, certain we are about states. Well, using Babette, this is um, very complex to do. You need to call the function createMCMC and you need to specify a chain length of 100,000. So this chain length is very short. You should use uh, longer chain lengths in your inference. Actually, there's one hidden parameter. So it, the MCMC will do, in a state, will do a measurement, then do a thousand random walks before it will do a measurement again. Uh, this is because the, the sampling should be independent, uh, but th that's implicit. So it creates an MCMC, it sets it, sets it up. Here's how we do it with Babette. And then we already have all the information to run, uh, to run BS2, to run to use Babette to do so. Because we have the alignment, we have the MCMC set up, and then we can already go to the, to the posterior. It is how you do it. You call Babette run on the alignment using that MCMC. And there's something that comes out of that uh, function. And one of the things is are the posterior trees. So it also shows you the parameter estimates and some other miscellaneous things. But one of the things it produces are the trees. 
and uh, there are a hundred trees but I throw away the first 50 because they're not in the representative part of uh, parameter space so I just use the last 50 ones to, uh, to work with so now I have my posterior tree so I throw away the parameter estimates I just use the trees and I'm going to visualize this result and Babette has a function called plot density tree and here it shows you uh, this uh, posteriors and it is a similar uh, picture as I've already shown you but one thing that goes wrong is that there is no time here yet it goes from 0 to 0 0.08 that's because we've never specified any measurement of time so this is some kind of internal measure that BS2 uses but it doesn't it, it's not a time unit so what we're going to do is we're going to add one level of complexity we're going to calibrate this tree and we're going to say that the, the crown age of that tree should be at a certain amount of time at a certain point in time so also we're going to use Babette for that so the first thing we're going to specify that the most recent common ancestor MRCA of all those species so that that's the crown age is a normal is has a time which is a normal distribution around a mean value of 17.58 and a standard deviation of 0.01 so basically we say that the crown age of all species is 17.58 million years ago and it's very narrowly distributed so I took this um, parameter est estimate from um, Purvis 1995 in the back of my presentation there will be references to the to the article itself in more detail but so we could be going to say it's a normally distribu normal distribution around that value we could also use a uniform distribution or whatever uh, because Bayesian inference is very flexible but in this case I'm going to use a narrow normal distribution around that crown age but we also need to specify which species have that crown age well in our case that will be all species so we're going to say that there's a, there's a MRCA prior that contains all species and follows this distribution so this is in the next slide it's shown so we're going to use a most recent common ancestor prior that contains all species you know the, the duplicate it's a, it's a feature uh, it follows that distribution we've just created and it's a monophyletic um, clay that means that also the species that go extinct are, are, are monophyletic with the, with these species so it can, that's uh, needed and so now we have our MCA prior contains all species with that crown edge we desire now we can do the Babette run so we call Babette on that FASTA file on that alignment using the MCMC we've just already used using our new prior and we only take the last 51 again notice it says here MRCA priors because Babette can also uh, provide for multiple priors as well as multiple alignments and so on so that's why you get this weird interface which you have to specify the faster file twice and uh, that's because due to that flexibility but for this simple case it looks a bit stupid but uh, it's a feature so from that we can visualize the results again and we see we get more or less the same figure as you already got and we can see that humans chimps that their common ancestor is most densely estimated at six million years ago which is uh, fine uh, also in coherent with the literature so that's great but how complex should that calculation be because it was very simple for example uh, because we've used all beast to default settings which means that we've um, used the Jukes Cantor nucleotide substitution model and the Jukes Cantor nucleotide substitution model assumes that if we have one of our four nucleotides it's equally likely to go from a C to a T than to mutate from a C to an A we know this doesn't uh, we know that's that's a definitely a simplification because the C and the T they are the smallest nucleotides so would there be some kind of DNA error then they would leave a small smaller gap and it's less it's likelier that one of those two fills it up again than the bigger of the two 
Additionally, we also assume the strict clock model, which means that the mutation rate is constant over all species. Whereas we know that uh, speciation rates can increase, like mutation rates can increase and decrease. There's no reason for it to be constant at all. And additionally, we assumed that the speciation process is constant in time. So there's a constant speciation rate and there's a constant extinction rate. And this doesn't make sense at all because then it would mean that we get an infinite amount of species after a while. So that, 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 that's, um, that's unrealistic. But uh, perhaps it is justified to do so. So I'm going to zoom in on this birth death tree model. Or the constant rate birth death tree model. So I've simulated one here. And you can see, for example, that uh, most speciation events happen close to the past because this is the present, this is the crown, crown age, and then we go closer to the present and here we have most species, we have about 10 species here. I only show the, the extinct, extant species, so all the extinctions are removed. Okay, this is how a constant rate birth death tree looks like. But it has some simplifications. For example, it assumes that speciation is instantaneous. It assumes, I go back to the tree again, it assumes that if, let's say yesterday, a speciation event started taking place, we can observe it today. And we know this is unrealistic. For example, Fennessy et al. They've, oops, they've checked giraffes in Africa, and we always thought that there was one giraffe species, uh, they did have subspecies. But apparently they found out that there were actually four giraffe species instead of one. So that's a big problem for conservation ecologists if you suddenly have four more species to conserve. And then you could argue, well, perhaps they start, they stopped interbreeding in the last century, but this is not the case. They already stopped interbreeding for the last two million years. So it took us two million years to observe that there were different species. So in the constant birth rate assumes we can immediately see that which is false. Also the constant rate birth death model assumes that all speciation events are independent. So imagine that this is Lake Tanjanika where there are a lot of cichlid species and when the water level goes down we suddenly have two populations. And also that may be a moment to trigger a, a mass speciation event. And it happens at the same time because both lakes have the same situation and it could be that there's more competition or that one resource is in one lake but not the other and the other way around. So speciation can co-occur and sometimes does co-occur. But these are assumptions that the constant rate birth death model doesn't do. So it's a simplification. So to zoom in on the speciation takes time idea, we know speciation takes time. There's a model, it's called the protracted birth death model by H. N. Rosendell 2012. And that model assumes that uh, if you have a speciation event, it's not, it, first speciation needs to be initiated and after a while it needs to be completed. And when a speciation event is initiated, you get an incipient species. That's a species that we do not recognize as such, or a species that does not have completed reproductive isolation. Uh, but let's stick to the to, to the observing. So an incipient species, we don't see it yet to be different. And after a while we have such an incipient species uh, completing its speciation and then it becomes a new observable species. So in this phylogeny we have two species we observe today. So we observe species 1 and we observe species 2. And all of the other species are still in the process of speciating and perhaps in the future we will observe this to be the case if they don't go extinct. But at the moment we underestimate the number of species present. So that's a protracted bird death model. That, uh, which, which is, um, so it is not exactly uh, perhaps closer to nature works, like perhaps it uses different mechanics like in this model, but it does have this little extra mechanism in that speciation takes time. You could debate on how well that is done, but it, it does allow you to, 
to speciation that it takes time to simulate that. Like the other uh, models, that speciation can co-occur. So this is called the multiple birth model by Giovanni Laudano, which provides that for some times that speciation can happen like normally, but sometimes there's a there's an external trigger, and at that moment a speciation uh, burst happens. So here we see three species that went speciating at the same time. So that's what the multiple birth model can do. And so these two models, the protracted birth death model and the multiple birth model, these are extensions of what we've been using, like the birth death model. And we know that both of the two, there's something to be said about them, because they are perhaps closer to nature, because we know both of these processes happen. So that brings us to the, to the, to the research question of this talk. What is the error we make today? What is the, what is the thing we ignore? What is the, our, our conclusions? Where do they go wrong? If nature follows uh, a multiple birth model or a protracted birth death model, what is the error we make today? And we can measure that as theoreticians by creating a true tree. So we create uh, a protracted birth death tree or a multiple birth tree, like the true tree that we will never be able to observe in nature. We can simulate the DNA alignments that follows exactly that tree. These DNA alignments, we do measure them in nature. And then we do our Bayesian inference, as I just did. And then we simply compare what the Bayesian inference tells us, that the, what the posterior trees are, and we compare them to the true tree that we know, that only we know as theoreticians. And then we'll have to use our judgment to determine if the error matters. So let's create a true tree. So uh, this is a simple step. I just used the multiple birth death tree I've just shown you. And here it is just to that you remember. So you see it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven tips. That's our true tree. So this is the truth. And from that we're going to simulate the DNA alignment that follows that tree. So I'm going to use uh, a pirouette function called sim alignment. On that tree, I use 100 nucleotides and a mutation rate of 0.2. So 0.2 per nucleotide mutation rate for, I think, two time units, I'm not sure. You see that there are some, um, some nucleotides that don't have information because they're like not mutated at all, which is just fine. It's just to show you this uh, example. And I need to save it to a file. And uh, so this is the alignment that we can use. So then we're going to use Babette on that same alignment. We're going to do b the Babette run on that alignment using our MCMC and again using only the last 50 trees and we're going to plot the results. What is already immediately clear is that in the tree, let's go to the tree, here we have these three speciation events occurring at the same time. But the error we make today is that these three speciation events are inferred to be at different points in time, which is logical because the birth death model assumes this to be the case, and from that it follows it is the case uh, in this um, in this visualization. So these are things that are uh, we know that there's an error there, and we're going to need to like uh, measure that error to quantify uh, the error. We're going to do that by comparing the true tree with our posterior trees. So what I've plotted here is in black, I've plotted the true tree. You can see that the speciation events here are at the same time. And in red, we see the first inferred tree. And you can see that the three speciation events are, uh, are put at different points in time, because we expect that from a birth death model that there are different uh, points in time. Well, to quantify the error between these two trees, and in the end uh, between uh, all posterior trees and the true tree, we're going to we need uh, need some way to express that. So we could measure, for example, a tree imbalance or Pagel's delta or uh, Alex Pigott's uh, gamma statistic. But we'll be using uh, a measure called the NLTT statistic. I'll show it in the next slide, which more or less measures the the area between these two. Uh, phylogenies. So we know that 
Um, so the n LTT is the number of lineages through time. Oh, and the n means normalized lineages through time. And the NLTT statistic normalizes time from 0 to 1 and the number of lineages from 0 to 1. So there are seven lineages in both cases, so that will be easy, but you can also compare different size trees so of different lengths. Because also, and also our crown ages are the same, so there's few normalization going on, but that's just how the statistic work. And this is how it looks like. So in black again we see the true tree. And the true tree has seven lineages. And in time it increases. And here is the point at which the three co-occurring speciation events occur. So it goes up one, two, three spots. And then it has the whole number of species. Whereas the red line, which uses the, 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 the inferred tree, the posterior tree, it gradually um, goes up. And goes up one species at a time. And then the NLTT statistic is simply the area between these two curves. It's not a squared error, no, it's just the sum of the error. And it's uh, invented by Thijs Jans et al. in 2015. But here I show you the comparison of one true tree in black and one posterior tree in red. Uh, but we have a full uh, posterior, so we should just use all of them and then we can get a histogram. Because this is one value, uh, let's say 0.01, and the posterior has multiple trees, so we get multiple values and we can plot that in a histogram. So that's where I do here, of the true tree and the posterior trees, I calculate the NLTT statistics and I use ggplot2 to put them in a histogram. And you can see that so this is the error. The error goes from 0 to 1, but 1 is beyond uh, beyond the graph because the highest error we get is 0 0.014 or something. We can also already see that the highest density of the error is around 0 0.06. But you should not use this th these results uh, much because the it's it's just too short run and not detailed enough. But we can already have an idea about alright, so there's an error here most most of the is here. So from that we need to measure we need we need to, to be become the scientist again. We need to give our judgment about if that error matters. So what I won't describe so that th there will be always an error. But uh, we need to plan our experiments in such a way that we can subtract the background noise. There will always be an error. So we will need to run our models with parameter settings that follow the birth death model. And both models I've showed you, like the protracted birth death and the multiple birth model, they both have parameter settings in which the model falls back to a birth death model. And that allows us to get an idea about what the background noise is, like what is the minimum error our experiment makes. But then we will still observe a difference between our background noise error and our, uh, our, our, our bigger error. And then we need to ask ourselves, like, is that difference big enough? Like, and when, when do they matter? And that is a, is a harder question. Uh, because in some, um, so it may be that on some islands or some settings, it, these parameter estimates are fine. But this is the harder question. When are they biologically relevant? And we'll need to use our judgment on that. But um, one thing that I hope, so what we hopefully don't conclude is, for example, here I have a picture of Adam and Eve and dinosaurs. So would we conclude that dinosaurs and Adam and Eve lived at the same time? I think then most scientists will agree that well something went wrong there. So the summary of this talk is that I think that Bayesian phylogenetics can seem very easy uh, because the, the slides I've just shown you this I think they seem very easy because Babette does a great job at making things easy. So, and I've actually used Babette to answer the core of a research question. 
uh, it's, yeah, the, the, this is the backbone of, uh, of decent research because of course you need more replicates, you need a more bigger sample size and so on. But you, it answered already a research question like what does the error we make if we use an MBD true phylogeny and we assume in our inference that it has a birth death prior, what is the error we make then? So that's the core of a research question. But uh, the details matter, like how do you do a fair comparison? Uh, and uh, so the devil is in the details, but this talk should is time limited, so I won't go into that. So these are the, the references I've showed you, and if there are any questions, I'll be open to that. And because this is a YouTube video, I won't, and I will just quit this video. So I wish you a, a nice day. Cheers.